The, in terms of a roadmap, I wanted to cover uh, basically f four things. Uh, I wanted to give you uh, some uh, sense of how we select diet energy uh, specifications. We tended not to be taught that in uh, graduate school. And uh, the financial value of, of fat is something that uh, has changed since 2006. Thought we'd spend a bit of time on that. Very practical stuff. Uh, in the sow, uh, there's a bit of a revision with respect to uh, the value of fat uh, for her. And then, and as you uh, may work with various groups in purchasing, uh, then it's very easy to put together a nice little tool to help them decide when something might be in or out of the ballpark. Uh, <clears throat> the uh, of course, nutritionists are the most valuable part of any organization. I think we can all agree on that, <laughs> except uh, maybe Mike back there. But uh, uh, at any rate, uh, in, in Optimum, we just as soon not put diets together that simply give us the lowest production cost because uh, lowest production cost uh, doesn't necessarily maximize the profit. And uh, if you're going to maximize profit, uh, then you have to be able to do some calculations like James Usry has taught us over the years of looking at return of overinvestment and paling. Uh, if you use it, it can be very profitable if used in the right time and right method, uh, but it doesn't decrease cost of production. It uh, can increase return over or, uh, total revenue and net revenue. And uh, if you were interested in, in low cost of production, you'd never do a 290-pound pig. So um, there's a couple things to consider. Uh, energy, as you well know, is the most expensive diet uh, component. And uh, the question is, and I think James Esri asked it a few years ago, is, is uh, how do we really choose the uh, energy level that you're going to set in the diet? And, and Keith Hayden and I lamented that we weren't really taught how to do that. And when we were in academia, we never taught how to do that. And it was kind of simple because we uh, dealt with mainly corn soy diets and the energy was what it was. And we might add 100 pounds of something else. And uh, But three things, I think, at least dis uh, distinguish practicing nutritionists. Uh, one is uh, they need to have uh, the ability to use a d very discriminating method for uh, uh, best costing the energy, uh, net energy system or effective ME is, is really uh, the most attractive if you can handle it right. Uh, you need to accurately value the incoming ingredients and that's probably one of the most frustrating. And so we, uh, several years ago, attached ourselves uh, to the Cargill labs in order to get uh, a more accurate uh, value there. And uh, uh, Excuse me, on the first one, I, I really jumped to three. But what I meant to say on the first one is you need to know uh, what base you should be on in, in the ballpark. And so how do you go about uh, determining that? Uh, the starting point, then, is to have an energy system that's the most discriminating. And so the net energy system is has always been one that's been uh, discriminating. But some of the estimates that were presented to us were uh, unbelievable, uh, literally uh, unbelievable. And uh, uh, but today, uh, because of a couple game changers, uh, such as the NRC providing for the first time some trustworthy estimates, and then having the ability, as with any estimate, it has to be growth validated. You just can't accept it and run off and calculate. Uh, you need to prove out and calibrate things uh, because the equations they use are good but they're not as complete as they will be in time and perhaps not as complete as they are in a couple of commercial companies. So, uh, but the, t the time is right uh, certainly because of the relatively complex uh, diets that we use today uh, to use those. Effective ME is one in which uh, it simply keeps em it keeps the energy in a realm that you can recognize it. If you just jump to any, you kind of feel that you don't know where you stand <laughs> unless you live in that world. And so with effective ME, 
which the NRC has uh, come up with, and years ago, a number of us used modified ME, but it was always saying, what is the net energy for an ingredient relative to corn? And then, once you get that relationship, which sorts out heat increment, then you can take that times uh, the corn uh, ME that you have and use that for the ingredients. So that's, that's what some of us still use. Um, now, if the energy values are, are correct, then you should be able to get a very predictable uh, caloric feed conversion. And I do this, uh, show this, uh, simply to show that the net energies that we had uh, determined are calibrated, I'll say, for certain ingredients, fat and wheat middlings at the time, uh, that those values were good, and so we got, as we should have, a very predictable caloric feed conversion where we fed very different diets. Now, it doesn't mean you're going to get a very predictable gain because uh, things will be a bit different there. But uh, in this study, uh, back in 2008, we had a corn-soy diet and had the net energy of it, and then uh, went to a, a low NE diet that had no fat but had 12% wheat mids. And so from the corn soy then jumped to a diet that had no wheat mids but had 80 pounds or 4% uh, fat on a per ton basis. And so we had diets that were very different on caloric value and in straight feed conversion, you, this would be the lowest, then this, and, and then this would be uh, the worst. But on a caloric basis, if you uh, have uh, predicted things right or calibrated according to what the pig agrees with, and we did this in a number of studies, then you should say your low ME or NE diet uh, is very close to the, the uh, corn uh, caloric feed conversion, as is the high fat. But for future reference, as we uh, get later in the presentation, uh, you'll note that the days that it takes uh, to get to uh, the 280 pounds was less if you use uh, the fat diet and a bit more uh, if using a, a diet with a bit more of the, we'll say, quote-unquote, fibrous components. These pigs uh, should really have eaten more to meet their caloric requirement, but um, you try eating some cardboard that's ground up and put in your cereal and see if you can eat that much. Uh, I, I didn't try it, but I, I, I convinced myself about thinking about it. Now, uh, once you, uh, you, you have the, en the energy system down and working well, then uh, what you want to do and what number have done for a long time uh, is to get the cheapest uh, diet you can in terms of the megacals of NE. So the dollar cost per megacal of NE is that which uh, is required to maximize profit. Now, in practice, if you're able to deliver on the carcass weight, then it's kind of simple. If you're not challenged there and you can give up two or three days, such as you saw with the uh, diet having the wheat mids in it, to get to the same end weight, if that's not a problem, then you'll simply go with the lowest cost NE, which you can get out of, the, out of a spreadsheet, and then your computer refines that for you. Now, if you're having some struggle, and summer would be a time when you wouldn't be feeding, uh, typically wouldn't be feeding uh, a lot of uh, something like wheat mids, corn germ, and feeding no fat, uh, then it's going to be a little, it's not as simple. And so you're, you can't have the lowest cost because you have to have a dietary level of energy. First, the form of the feed uh, that doesn't impact intake, and there's a certain reduction of uh, intake as you increase NDF, and we plotted that out uh, using various components. We know how increasing NDF from various components changes intake, and so we can go to a level that uh, allows us uh, to lose only the amount of days we feel we can tolerate. But So uh, the summertime is not one of those times. 
Now there's four pieces, actually five pieces of foundation data that uh, uh, we really needed to uh, determine the energy specification. But one of the most fundamental uh, things that we have to have is that for every uh, weight, we need to know what the caloric uh, uh, feed conversion is. What are the kcals of Ne uh, to get us uh, the uh, gain? And so we measure these uh, about every five to six years just to determine how things have changed because uh, during that time, lean composition changes just a bit. And so knowing this relationship, then you can, ask, you can isolate parts of it and say, what is the cheapest way I can formulate a diet to provide the calories that the pig is going to need? <clears throat> and so uh, I think Kansas State is, and perhaps others have, uh, formalize this into spreadsheets that help you think this through, but this just gives you an example of what we use. We have a, a spreadsheet and I've just taken a bite out of it. And so here's the corn soy standard against high fat and uh, we don't go to 5% because the pig we have doesn't use 5% as well as it does 4%. It kind of gets beyond itself and its ability to use. And so we have the uh, low energy diet and we've looked at the, uh, how NDF level will impact days to gain and this is as much as we can use in a non-summer setting. In a summer setting this would be decimating. But if you, uh, in this program, again I've taken a small bite out of it, if we look at feeding phases uh, the, from uh, an 18 pound stretch then the mean or the average uh, uh, caloric uh, feed conversion for the animal is 1.93. And so in order to gain those 18 pounds, it's going to have to have about 35 total megacals of NE. And a corn soy diet on an NE basis will have this level of energy. And as you can see, if you're used to effective ME, you don't know where you're at. Um, I barely know where I'm at. And so at this uh, level of energy density, then it's going to take 30 pounds of the corn soy diet at this, this uh, dollar cost per ton, and this was done a while back, uh, and this much for the phase. And then you go to the next phase, and again, you look at the caloric feed conversion, the total amount of feed, and given the energy density of the diet, you just keep getting these uh, dollar costs. And so uh, you'll say, now we'll go to the next thing, the high energy, and you have these elevated net energies, and when you go through those same calculations, you find that it's going to cost you money in this phase, it's going to cost a little money in the next phase, and you keep adding those up, and that's a cost you're willing to bear uh, if it's summer, and you have to have the live weight or the carcass weight, and you can value it. But in a non-summer mode, if time is not an issue to get the weight that you need, uh, then that would not be the route of choice for us. Uh, we would typically uh, be more in this line. So we will have a corn soy level of energy here, uh, high fat here, and we go backward to uh, something below a corn soy energy. And we know we're going to give up about three days uh, a time. We ask ourselves, is that compromise going to cost us a problem? So that gets us into the ballpark and close to the base. And from there, um, once you find what base you want to be on, then the computer will do optimizations uh, if you have different uh, versions. But in Brill, you change the weighting factor uh, 0.98 from 1 to 1 to 0.98 to 102 and it will go through iterations to get it so the energy uh, that is provided is as low cost as it can and yet have it balanced with the other nutrients, especially amino acids. Now, <clears throat> in the NRC, uh, <clears throat> they, they show that the ME of fat relative to ME of corn is 2.3 times, 3.9 times. And ME is a really poor predictor of value for fat and for soybean meal. You almost couldn't get it worse. And uh, as you turn to their net energy, it's 2.85 times. We get 2.92. So they're actually very good. They've done a, 
that was a tough decision for them to make, and they made a, a quite a good decision based on our pigs. We have uh, 5,000 pigs that really agree with them. They were quite happy with the estimate. So you might say, how much could I pay for fat? Uh, you could just intuitively say if we were to create, and again, Kansas State has this on the website for you, but we have our own data and spreadsheet. If we, one of the foundation pieces of information we have to have is we have to know the responsiveness of the pig to increasing uh, uh, levels of fat. We have to know it by phase and we have to know it by gender. And we just want to see if the gelts at any point have thrown us a, uh, thrown us a curveball. If you look at the feed cost of gain, and if the vet system is driven by feed cost of gain only, uh, then this f fat price at three times the corn price w would be about expected to give you uh, no additional cost at increasing fat. But there comes a point at which, because the fat is not used as efficiently, uh, marginally, uh, when you go from four to five percent and on up to six, then this was the reason it begins to turn. Now, uh, today, the fat corn price is about four and a half. Um, and uh, so if you went at three and a half, as I did back some time ago, then this, you know that you're going to increase the, the cost, whereas in the old days, the more fat you, in, you added, you tended to actually uh, be a world champion in feed conversion and then also uh, save some money in the process. Now, the financial value of fat, and I'm sorry if, to some of you if you know uh, if this is uh, too routine, <clears throat> but uh, I'm kind of working my way through this. Uh, if you, if you value, value the, the creation of gain for fat as you would in the summer, then uh, it might look like this. And, and we've got nice spreadsheets developed, and you simply plug in the various variables. And uh, if we brought this fat to corn, that's 3.5 times uh, to 1, and brought that curve over as we increase level of fat, this is what was happening. But when we value the gain that comes out of it, that's a part of that spreadsheet, and then it can be corrected for lean if, if you see uh, you have an increasing uh, tendency to be less lean. Uh, all those things fit into it. But uh, uh, this means that in a non-summer mode, I'm definitely not going to be using fat. Uh, and in a summer mode, though I value the gain so much, I could actually pay four and a half to five times the price of corn simply to get the gain. I'm struggling every uh, minute of the day to, to get that. The great fat conundrum that hit us about 2006 that a lot of our managers have had a hard time dealing with is they've been used to trying to be world champions in feed conversion. And uh, today, if you still want to be a world champion, you'll pay for it. Uh, uh, you, you're going to have to give up some feed conversion. And some people can't get out of the mindset that I can only, I, I need to be in this area of feed conversion. And uh, uh, it could be a liability for a nutritionists to try to do the right thing uh, rather than deliver on their expectation because it's a, it's a hard one for them to get. And so uh, what happened? Uh, when we used to add fat, most of the time uh, it gave us lower feed costs. It was a profitable thing to do. Uh, 2006 era, uh, in came biodiesel, fat became and oils became an important part. If the management's fixated on having a certain feed conversion, uh, you're probably duty bound to use 40, 50 pounds of fat. Uh, and that's the way it is for a lot of people. In our case, uh, I had to prove, uh, again, working with two other systems, that uh, in fact, this dynamics of where we should be on fat or no fat uh, worked from a profit standpoint. And then every six months, I give um, uh, matrices that says, here's what the feed uh, conversion will be in the field. And for the senior management, this is a caloric feed conversion we're after. And here's the levels on average, and here's the interference levels. So that's worked for us. Uh, uh, I haven't gotten fired yet. 
And so the conundrum it, that we, and some of what I needed to show our people, is uh, in the old-fashioned days uh, when uh, corn, fat to corn price ratio was below three, then knowing that the um, net energy ratio is close to three, you know you're going to save money using fat. And so if for each uh, phase of uh, growth, or as you go through the growth of the pig, if you look at the price of diets having 80 pounds of, of fat in them, and you go through this uh, entire growth uh, period for the pig, you can compute the cents per megacal of effective ME. Uh, so, and the corn soy diet is going to cost you more, and that's, uh, that's how it used to be. And so you could turn to uh, this scenario and say, well, here's the fee conversion I received uh, for high fat. Here's a fee conversion uh, I got for corn soy. Uh, and I'm pr if I'm not the world champion, I'm pretty close to it. And it made sense because it didn't cost me any more to do it. It was, it was cheaper and better to do it that way. <clears throat> but in the case where uh, fat price gets out of control, and this is a pretty good reflection of what it is now, then uh, using a, uh, an 80 pound per ton uh, level of fat and going across the uh, body weights as uh, the computer calculates it, here's the cost of the energy per megacal. And I'm decreasing soybean meal, so that helps me get to a more efficient uh, form of energy. But you can see the fat's going to cost me more at any point to feed than the corn soy. And so I can still be a world champion by feeding the high fat, but it's going to cost me indeed uh, if if I do it. And, uh, and there's a fair number of people, unfortunately, that haven't been able to make the switch, and so it'll cost them two, two and a half, three dollars a pig uh, to have very low, very recognizable levels of feed conversion. Um, that's the growing pig, and how I want it to end is uh, with respect to the sow. Uh, Bud Harmon made a very good point. In terms of the lactating sow, uh, it was pretty standard to add fat almost at any time, but especially in the summer. And uh, in the 80s and 90s, when they had high-octane diet that had a lot of fat and it was sprayed on pellets so they could get even greater levels of fat added, it was easier, it was more easy <laughs> to uh, show that adding fat was a benefit in terms of return to estrus and uh, the fact the sows didn't uh, lose as much weight and maybe that the pigs were actually grew just a little better. And in those times, even though litters weren't um, uh, large, the, uh, the feeding method was such that you, it could hardly be said that we full fed. A lot of times we thought we didn't. And I conducted experiments where I said the sows were full fed, but when I went out to feed them, uh, the feeders were empty and I didn't have any way back. And so if I don't have way back, the sows weren't full fed. So be cautious of my 78 publications. So they aren't full fed. But uh, what happened in this particular, uh, uh, recently with David Rosero and his stuff, is we found we were looking at uh, the uh, value of two types of fats, and we looked at it in lactation where we had increasing levels of fat. And uh, I won't show you the experiment, but uh, David's talking about it now in another room. But at any rate, we found that in lactation, we looked at a number of things, and neither fat under heat stress did too much for us in terms of pig weight gain. The pigs were truly full fed. But we looked at gain over feed, or excuse me, feed conversion. We found that feed conversion improved with increasing levels of choice white grease. But they actually got slightly worse with increasing levels of AV blend. So the two fats took us in different directions. It said they weren't being used equally. So you might be thinking of Jerry Shearson and, and his uh, thoughts about uh, fat quality. So even though there were different effects in lactation, there was, a diff diff there was the same effect 
in reproduction. And so what we decided was there's a deficit in essential amino acids or fatty acids that was most likely uh, to make its appearance uh, with large litters and especially older sows. And uh, just to give you a sense, in terms of, we did this study, we did 17 total, 100 total sows in several studies, but the proportion of sows bred, if they were fed, uh, <clears throat> increasing levels of, the, of apparent omega-6 fatty acid, linoleic, uh, we fed different levels. We actually titrated those out. And we found that if you were feeding a 3.3% uh, uh, per, linoleic acid, that they, they gently returned to estrus and bred quicker. But what we found, in, irrespective of level, is that during heat stress, they, all, they conceived. We had 93 or 4% conception. It wasn't, a, it wasn't an issue of making them conceive in heat stress. It was a matter of retaining the pregnancy, and that's what it boiled down to. And as David looked at, and it would be better if he had the same level of conception, he just took those that were all, that all conceived. But as you found, uh, for those sows that had a lower level of linoleic acid, over time, they were less likely to maintain their pregnancy if they had 2.1, and, and your corn, soy, DDG diets would typically not quite be there, or barely so. And you had to be higher in order to retain the pregnancy. And what he, so what he found is, is that there was a minimum level of essential fatty acid, in this case uh, linoleic acid, to retain the pregnancy. And then once the pregnancy was retained, then the amount of the population in that increased with the level of linoleic acid that you gave. So it's probably one of the most significant finds uh, that, there, that there is in, in the lactating area and fat. So from a purchasing standpoint, uh, we look at it uh, for the growing pig as the cost for the various oils, and this was out of David's dissertation, we didn't uh, update it, at the price of the various oils you, you might have, there's corn oil as well, and looking at the effective ME and the cost, you can see that among them, AV blend would be, for a growing pig, a, slight, a gentler, uh, a better cost. And so it's, on a growing pig, the basis of choosing is basis, uh, based on the cost per megacal of effective ME. Now for the sow, and this is the last part, um, again, we have a number of sources, and corn oil is, should be in here. Uh, we use corn oil as well, but you can't hardly beat uh, the price on a per pound of linoleic acid uh, for soy oil, corn oil. You see these others are good, but we basically outlawed tallow. If I'm feeding a tallow diet or t a, a corn soy diet with some wheat mids and tallow, uh, I'll never be able to retain the pregnancies, and if I switch corn to Milo, I'm dead meat. And that accounts for some of the great variations we've seen over time. So we have to um, look at the sow and fat in a little different way. And we feed corn oil, um, some poultry, uh, soy oil, but tallow's disallowed uh, for the sows.